Well, welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And my guest today is Douglas Squirrel, or he said you can call him Squirrel. From most a- people do. Most people do. So welcome to the show. Just delighted to have you on today. Likewise. Now, Glad now, to be here. For season four, you know, my team's always pushing me out of that comfort zone. So we went video this year and we changed things up. And I thought I could read bios and say how great people are, but it's your story. So will you tell our listeners who are listening from 65 countries, tell us a little bit about Squirrel. Sure. So um, first thing to say is this is a 600-year-old house behind me here. So I'm very proud to live in England and be English. Uh, although I talk funny. So um, let's get used to that. And um, I've been writing computer programs since I was six years old. And um, you can tell from the couple of gray hairs that that was a pretty long time ago. So it was a a pretty primitive computer. Um, My professional career has been as a CTO, VP engineering, all of those kinds of executive titles. And I worked in several companies and, and I got fired from every one. Now, I got fired in this very nice way that uh, the CEO or someone like that would come to me and say, Squirrel, you've built this amazing team and they're performing really well. And we in, in, uh, have this great leader who does most of the work now. And there, there's not much for you to do. And gosh, you're kind of expensive. So would you please go be wonderful somewhere else? And I uh, kind of twigged after a while after getting fired like this that maybe this was what I was good at. So since then, I became a consultant And now I work with teams all around the world. I don't know if it's been 65 countries. You're making me want to go count now. But um, more than 200 different organizations on making their tech teams insanely profitable. So us tech people don't usually talk about profit. We also don't talk about emotions very much, which I imagine you and I are going to want to talk about, Deb. Absolutely. um, I I get engineers talking about those kinds of concepts and make them uh, uh, really sing and and perform um, uh, because... Uh, I'm helping them to have difficult conversations. I love that. And that's why I wanted you on the show. So Great. my first leadership question, you have said that emotions are valuable signals, but verify what suggests to you how to get through a difficult conversation. So let me mm-hmm. let me wrap some context. Analytical, logical mind, just want to get things done, don't want to feel, big thinkers, Share some strategies around that, because that's going to be a big percentage of our listeners. Yeah. So um, us engineers, we, we um, uh, tended to go into computer programming because computers are easier to talk to than humans for us. Um, for, for many people who are on, at the other end of the kind of emotional availability spectrum, um, the computer is very frustrating to deal with because it doesn't understand what you mean. It just deals with black and white and zero and one. And uh, we really like that. But the thing is that conversations are a skill that you can develop. And one of the things I'm always coaching people on, wherever they sit in the organization, is that um, a conversation is is um, something that you're not born able to do well. And everyone thinks, gosh, I learned to talk when I was two. Why can't I have a good conversation? But if you start analyzing your conversations, then you start to find out, gosh, and it all, I was doing this just last week with um, two very technical people. They had a wonderful debate about what they were going to do and and would they do it this way or would they adopt that approach or would they use this team or that team? And I counted during their conversation how many times each one asked the other one a question. The Mm -hmm. conversation is about 30 minutes long um, and uh, I I got them, if I was really generous, with eight questions. And uh, that's a pretty typical score. And um, it's not unusual to have zero questions. So I'd encourage your listeners to try that exercise with anybody, engineers or not. It really applies to anyone. And um, uh, if you start to analyze your conversation that way, then you will learn a lot about how your conversation could be more effective because they would have learned a lot and it probably would have taken them five minutes, not 30, if they just asked a few key questions along the way to clarify. They talked at cross purposes. They didn't understand each other. Well, they had difficulties that would have been resolved by questions. Now, simple interventions like mm-hmm. that can make a huge difference in how executives work with each other, and it applies to tech teams. You'd think that 
oh gosh, maybe they can just get by with, um, you know, kind of telepathy and using chat GPT and things like that. Absolutely not. You need more talking, you need more interaction when you're building extremely complex systems. Now I can go on, but how am I doing so far? Absolutely. No, uh, just so many key points. So my second question has permanent residency on the show. I've asked Mm -hmm. over 260 leaders this question. Wow. What imperfections does Squirrel bring to his heart-centered leadership? Oh, wow. Fantastic. Um, Well, I'll answer that two ways. I'll I'll talk to you about what things I'm not as good at and what I do to to backfill them and deal with them. But first, I'll talk about um, imperfections that I ask my clients, clients to make use of. So I'm not sure which way you want it, but I'm going to take it both those two ways and see if it's helpful. So uh, when my clients come to me, they're usually um, rising leaders. They're people who are trying to expand beyond where they are today. And they might be the CEO trying to deal with new tech people, new tech directions. It might be the chief technology officer trying to grow their team. It might be a salesperson who's uh, trying to sell what the technology people have, which is its own particular challenge working with, uh, with engineers to sell things. Whatever their situation is, one of the things I help them to do is to to reify what they're working with, to take it from being kind of vague, unclear, uh, messy kind of stuff, and uh, like we'd like our customers to buy more, we want to upsell, we want to um, uh, be dominant in our market, something like that, to uh, we will produce this feature, uh, we will sell it to customers this way, it will be done at this time, Um, we, we get it all lined up. Now, they have different skills at doing that. Some of them are not as good at doing that. It's It comes more naturally to some folks mm-hmm. than to others. But what I tell them is it's not terribly important which buckets you put things in mm-hmm. and whether you get them all right. And, and I tell them often, people talk about leading indicators. I say, I'd rather you were looking for imperfect indicators. Mm-hmm. Look for something that tells you you're on the path. You're, on, you're landing your airplane. And if you've ever landed an airplane, you know that you're always kind of up and down. You're never quite on the path. Yes, you get the, you know, airplanes land analogy. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Airplanes do land and they land because people are always making corrections. So one of the crucial skills is to take the imperfections that you have. Hey, I'm not as good at understanding what the tech people are doing. Man, it's difficult for me to understand what customers want because I'm sitting here deep in the technology team. Yeah. Whatever the limitation might be, don't worry about it. Don't be constrained by it. Say, look, I'm going to see whether I can increase my understanding. Can I get more feedback from my customer? Can I get more interaction with the engineering team? And whether I have the exact right number or not, whether I have the perfect indicator, doesn't okay. matter. I know whether I'm going up or down. And if I know that, then I can land the airplane. Absolutely. So that's my I philosophy love, about that. imperfections. Good. Um, and, and so I'll finish answering what you might have been aiming for more, which is where are their imperfections for me. Uh, well, certainly one is that I never understand my customers' businesses. So uh, I was just looking at uh, one earlier today that does uh, financial transactions in Africa. Um, I have another one I just finished up that does um, human resources around the world. Um, uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday who does some um, artificial intelligence for factories to make sure that the right machines are in the right place with the right maintenance. I don't know anything about all of those. I have no clue how my customers' businesses work. I learn a lot about them. You know, I can tell you an awful lot about biotech and mouse models now because I've worked with a bunch of different companies uh, who are trying to cure Parkinson's and other wonderful things like that. But the um, the um, uh, thing that I do well and the thing that allows me to un- overcome that imperfection uh, is that I understand the process. I understand the tools like conversations and um, uh, executive uh, uh, projection of power in a way that's actually productive rather than um, destructive. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Those are skills and tools and techniques that I can teach people, whatever industry they might be in. So uh, I've learned to embrace the fact that I I know nothing about my clients' businesses and I won't. Um, It's entertaining to to get good at those things, to understand a little bit, but the the crucial thing is uh, the techniques for the people rather than the um, details of the technology, which I'm, I'm never going to be better at than the client. Absolutely, and and bringing your toolkit to the process. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about, we've talked about how conversations are a skill to improve who we are as people and and what we bring to our leadership. Asking probing questions of experts is also a valuable executive skill. What Mm -hmm. do you mean when you say that engineers are not wizards? Ah, now I have to get something out for you here. Let's see if I still have it down here. I think I do. 
Your Harry so Potter under, wand? Say again? No, not quite. Um, <laughs> but it's a certificate. Now, I'd be willing to send any of your listeners one of these certificates. So I will just offer this because, uh, I, you know, I had them printed just before the pandemic hit. So I haven't been able to send out as many as I'd want because um, I used to meet a lot of people in person. Now I do a lot more uh, on the screen. You can't read it, but um, what it says is that um, uh, I give you my official permission to ask questions of software developers, system admins, designers, QA staff, and other technologists, including what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Can I see the results? When will it be done? And why don't we do this instead? So if you want an official permission to do that, just write to me. Uh, I'm sure we'll put the address and things in the in the show notes. It's just you got to tell me where to send it. I'm happy to uh, send one along personally signed by me. And the reason I made all that is not just to have a cool thing to show, but also because it's so important that people feel they have that permission. Mm-hmm. And the problem with technology and a few other things, finance is in this category. Um, uh, you know, if you have some very deeply technical thing like that manufacturing company, um, you know, they're, they're, they have deep understanding of factories in a way I'm never going to know. Um, those people who have that kind of wizard experience nice. are kind of intimidating because they talk funny, right? They, they use all these fancy words. And, you know, in our world, we talk about deployment via Kubernetes and uh, lambdas in a- Amazon Web Services and your brain kind of explodes, right? And you mm-hmm. just say, oh, my God, I can't possibly understand that. So I can't ask them any questions. Mm-hmm. And that's what's wrong because – and that's why I want to give you official permission from Squirrel – that it is totally fine. In fact, it is vital that yes. you ask those kinds of dumb sounding questions because it forces the person who is the wizard to come to your level and explain Absolutely. what the heck they're doing. And Absolutely. I cannot count for you the number of clients I have come to ask some dumb questions like that. Yeah. And I found out that half of what they're spending on technology, which is usually a huge amount of their budget, is being wasted. It's not on things that are relevant. But because somebody dressed it in fancy language and somebody else wasn't willing to ask any questions about it, they they uh, went ahead with a project or a, a mm-hmm. change or a refactoring that, that wasn't necessary. And Absolutely. Uh, only when you can get your, your wizards to be accountable for what they're doing and why it's valuable, why it's, there's a return on investment for your spending with them, only then should you go ahead and approve whatever it is they're going to do. Don't let them get away with saying, oh, you can't understand. I love it. Okay, my last leadership question is, I want you to talk about the ladder of inference and why oh. it appeals to technical people. I love this. Oh, this I'm is a fun one. It is. It, absolutely. So I, I don't know if, do you know the ladder of inference? It's um, most popularly talked about in the fifth discipline by Senga. Yeah. Um, but it actually comes from a guy called Chris Argyris who did wonderful social science research that's impenetrable. Nobody can read it. So you have to go and analyze it. And and in my book that I wrote with my co-author, Jeffrey Frederick, uh, we kind of unpacked that for um, uh, technology teams because it's a technology. It's actually Mm -hmm. a set of tools that you can use really effectively. um, But it's all kind of buried in these ancient 1970s um, theoretical textbooks. But um, the ladder of inference, uh, go look up a picture of it. It's a a very helpful um, uh, visual uh, is, is a tool that you can use to go from what people observe to wh- how they're acting. And right. I'm putting it here um, on the on the video so for anybody who's watching rather than listening, and I'm kind of starting down here with my chin and I'm finishing up here at the top of my head. And that's because the ladder is kind of visible at the bottom. We can all observe things in the, mm-hmm. in the universe around us, and we can observe what people do. That's the action kind of up here at the top. Everything else is inside your head. Mm-hmm. And by definition, you can't see inside someone else's head. If anybody out there has telepathy, please write to me. I have great startup ideas. You know, we can really work <laughs> on it. But if you don't have telepathy, then you need things like the ladder of inference to see inside the other person's head. And the great thing about it is this tool, this way of asking questions that kind of take you from the data up to what that which data is important, uh, what it means, um, what um, uh, um, beliefs you have as a result of that, and so on, then takes you up to the top mm-hmm. and what you might act on. That gives you an insight into someone else's reasoning. It's very similar to software testing. So engineers are used to doing something called test-driven development, mm-hmm. which is a way of going slowly when you write software so you actually know what you're doing. And when I talk to them about it, I say it's test-driven development for people, also known as the ladder of inference. And the wonderful thing about it is um, it's kind of mechanical. It's kind of an algorithm. It's a recipe. It's a thing you can follow. And engineers love that. Boy, that's really great for us. So there's a lot of these types of tools 
um, that uh, make it really accessible for anyone uh, to follow a set of steps to understand someone else's reasoning. So you don't say things like, I bet you've heard this kind of thing from, from lots of people. Um, uh, oh, oh gosh, those suits over there, you know, they're just telling us engineers what to do. Uh, those salespeople, they just don't understand us. You can't let them do that. You say, hang on a second, I want you to apply test-driven development for people, apply the ladder of inference, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you can explain to me their reasoning, because they're not doing it because they're insane. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it because they hate you. They're probably selling things that we don't have in our software because they don't know about it, or they haven't asked you about it, or you've intimidated them with your weird jargon, and so they're not able to understand it. Go find out which one of those is true, and don't talk to me about it until you have, and mm -hmm. here's the tool. And uh, the wonderful thing about when you do that is you get this tremendous empathy and understanding um, from the person who formerly was saying this person's nuts because they're only seeing the action. They suddenly understand the reasoning. And usually halfway up, they say, wait a minute, I had no idea that you're doing that, but you don't understand this other thing. And, and suddenly you get this tremendous opportunity to act um, and, and change the reasoning because you understand how they got from the data they were seeing to the action in the world. Absolutely. Great, great analogy and strategy. I love the way you explained it. Okay, Thank I'm going to I'm going to switch to my fab 4. We just want to know what's sitting on the top of that brilliant mind of yours. First question. Name or give us a word or phrase that shows up in your daily leadership language. Mm. Well, I'll kind of give you an anti-word. I'll give you a word I don't let people use. And that is every time I hear the word convince, I stop people. And I say, no, you're not allowed to use the word convince anymore. And they say, well, what am I supposed to do? I want to convince those people over there to do the software this way or sell this way or whatever it is. And I say, uh, what you're going to do instead is you're going to come to understand their reasoning. And we're Absolutely. back to the ladder of inference. S sit, it, so, sit in that observer's chair. I love that. Indeed. So uh, take out the word convince. That's a word that is uh, pre um, um, noticeable by its absence. Love it. Okay, second question. Name a book that you've read at any time in your life that was impactful. What was the name of the book and the author, and what was your takeaway? Oh, fascinating. Ah, um, uh, the book was uh, Learned Optimism. It's an American term, so we'd say learnt in Britain, but Learned Optimism. It's by Martin Seligman. And I read the audio book on an extremely boring railway journey to Belgium. Um, you know, I'm sure Belgium is <laughs> wonderful, but I was not going to the wonderful part of Belgium. I was going to the boring part of Belgium, and it was a very boring railway trip. Um, but the book was fascinating, and I only read it once. I did all the exercises, and when I got off the train, I didn't have imposter syndrome anymore. And, and I love it really that. cured it for me. So I don't have that belief that, you know, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't understand these things. Um, if anything, um, you know, I'm a bit too far the other way, which is very helpful for confidently inspiring other people. I, I and it that. was all due to that book because I had a lot of doubts before. And when I read and did the exercises to change my self-talk, to change yes. how I described my experiences to myself, um, it, it really uh, altered, altered my thinking because I went from saying, I'm always bad at this, I don't understand this, I'm not good at this, to saying, in that case, I didn't understand it. And generally, Indeed. I'm very good at this type of thing. And when you shift that thinking, that habit of mind, uh, it, it really can uh, turn around your your internal monologue. Absolutely. Okay, third question. I have to put a bit of context to this. I'm granting you a wish. Mm -hmm. You get to have dinner with a leader of your choice. Now, this leader may have passed away or is, is living. Oh. Mm -hmm. who, who are you having dinner with and what is the dinner conversation? Now, that is fascinating. There are too many good ones. Yeah. I mean, I mean, part of me wants to have dinner with Donald Trump just to understand what's behind all that. <laughs> the psyche, right? <laughs> yeah, where, where did he yeah. come from? I, yeah. I don't understand him at all. Or Elon Musk, the same. Yeah. Um, uh, they could they both get a rocket ship and stay on Mars, as far as I'm concerned. But um, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I'd have to say Ed Catmull from Pixar, because there's such a fascinating journey. If you haven't read his um, story of the, the company, it's absolutely worth reading. I can't remember the title, but, um, uh, you know, they started, he, he kind of formed this band of um, crazy animators with this dream and kept it going for 20 years until they had Toy Story. I mean, this thing goes back mm -hmm. to the early 1970s. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, he, he has a kind of um, 
uh, gentle but firm leadership that I think is missing in a lot of places. You know, people idolize a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk or somebody like that who yeah. very decisive, get a lot done. Yeah. Um, but um, man, they make a lot of enemies and a lot of pain along the way. And Catmull yeah. seems to have done better on that. It's not perfect. Um, you know, there are some problems with with Lassiter and his team and and so on. There's, it's certainly not a perfect story. But um, I think I'd want to ask him about uh, how he he kept a sort of gentle optimism through 20 years in the wilderness and uh, then 20 years um, inside Disney, <laughs> which was kind of a mad environment as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's a good one. That's what I'd be interested in. Well, before I ask you my last question and we close out the show, I just want to say I'm so glad we met. It's been delightful to chat to you. I knew it was going to be a good conversation. I'm going to have you finish this sentence for me to finish the show. Heart-centered leadership is? Heart-centered leadership is acknowledging that emotions are a very useful component of human interaction and they belong at work managed in a thoughtful and empathic way to tell you how to make your business more successful, both in terms of people and profit. 